Welcome to this third video on multivariate twin modeling. Um, before I start talking statistics, let me first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dirk Pelt, and I'm uh, currently a postdoc at the Biological Psychology Department of the VU, also where Connor works. Um, I'm currently working on a well on different projects related to uh, the genetics on uh, well of well-being, and I currently have a paper. Uh, in revision, that is um, on the genetic overlap between personality and well-being. And in this paper, I use um, the model that I will talk about in this video and the next the independent pathway model, and also the model that Connor will talk about in the last video, the common pathway model. So having worked with these models extensively, um, I'm excited to um, talk to you about it uh, in this video and the next. So. What I'm going to do in this video is give a short recap on the multivariate model, then talk about the psychometric common factor model, and then apply this to um, twins to arrive at the independent pathway model, uh, also called the biometric model. Shortly, just uh, a slide on the notation. If you get confused later on, you can uh, scroll back in the video to um, yeah, refresh your memory a bit. So, but um, yeah, let's pick up where we left off uh, with Connor in the last video. So let's take the skin fault data as an example again. So we had um, measures of body fat across different locations in the body. Um, well, with four phenotypes, we know that we have an eight by eight matrix for the twins. And the expected, um, Covariance matrices for the MZ twins and DC twins are shown on the left. And they should now, I think, not be, uh, you should be familiar with them now because Connor talked about it quite extensively. And in the multivariate ADE model, we simply estimate these A, D, and E covariance matrices, which are all four by four um, matrices. So using um, the twin model, and again, Connor also said this, but the twin model is really a means to an end, namely to be able to decompose the variance in um, traits or the covariance in different variance components. But using this twin model, we could um, decompose the phenotypic covariance in uh, additive and non-additive or dominant effects and um, non-shared environmental effects, so sigma A, sigma D, sigma E. I've shown the unstandardized values here, but of course we can um, calculate, simply calculate the standardized values by dividing the variance components by the total variance, as I have done here for biceps. And remember, the, um, just A is the narrow sense heritability, that's what we call it, and A and D together is the broad sense heritability. So in this case, it's uh, around 78%. And of course, sometimes maybe you want to express the, um, um, the, the additive, non-additive and non-shared environmental effects on the covariances as a, as a percentage. Again, just by uh, not, um, dividing variance components by the total covariance in this case between biceps and triceps. And here we see that 28% is due to additive genetic effects and 54% um, of the Covariance between biceps and triceps is due to dominance genetic effects. So keep in mind that this is only um, simply expressing the, co uh, the covariance or the variance components on the covariance. Um, as a percentage, these are not genetic or environmental correlations because these are uh, shown on this slide. Um, right, so the genetic correlations, um, these express the extent to which the genetic factors underlying one trait overlap with the genetic factors uh, underlying the other traits in the model. So to what extent the genetic factors um, underlying the phenotypes are the same. Similarly, the environmental correlations express the extent to which um, environmental factors for different traits overlap. And um, Connor, in the previous two videos, showed how to um, arrive at these values 
in terms of parameterization of the model. So I'm not going to reiterate, reiterate this uh, here. So if you um, find it puzzling how we get to these values, then I, I recommend going back to the first videos by Connor. So focusing on the uh, dominance correlations, we see that they are generally quite high, um, close to one, and some are even larger than one, which is a bit weird, right? Because correlations, well, um, they should be between minus one and one. So how can this be? Well, um, this is because in this, the software that we use, OpenMX, we simply ask them, the software to estimate unconstrained covariance matrices. So we do not pose any constraints on the values here. We do not say, do not say we have, they have to be between minus one and one, whatever. So they can take any value. And because of sampling um, variability, sometimes you can see that this is what happens. But in general, this is an indication that the correlations are actually in reality one or very close to it. Um, but let's go back to our um, unstandardized um, estimates of our variance components of sigma A, sigma D, and sigma E. Well, we can call this the unconstrained um, ADE model or saturated ADE model. And why saturated or unconstrained? Well, we just simply estimate all of the elements in the the matrices, right? So here we have estimate four variances on the diagonal and six covariances. So in total, 10 um, parameters in each of these matrices. So it's really fully unconstrained. We just estimate all of them. But what we can also do is just, um, or is impose a, a model on these covariance matrices. So um, for example, because we have some theoretical notion about um, which, ge um, which genetic factors or how many genetic factors influence the covariances among traits. So we can impose a formal model on these covariance matrices, a factor model. And this is what I'm gonna um, talk about on the next uh, slides. So I'm gonna talk about the most um, simple model where there's just one single factor. Um, influencing traits or phenotypes or whatever. Um, so, and in this following slides, I want you to, um, for a short while, completely forget about twins, genetics, or whatever, because I'm just going to talk about um, phenotypic correlations, only to later include uh, genetics and stuff. So, because here I've shown um, correlations among items of the trait openness to experience, which is one of the uh, big five uh, factors, personality factors. So we administered some an openness to experience questionnaire to 300 students, and these are the correlations we find. Well, the common factor model then um, tries to explain these correlations, which are modest in size, try to explain these correlations by um, posing a single common factor, a latent common factor, as the source of variation or individual differences in these items or in the item responses. So if this is true, if there's one common um, factor influencing all these item responses, then we can actually expect correlations to occur. Why? Well, some, let's say we have two people, one who's in reality very open, so it has a high stance on the latent common factor um, openness to experience, then if we um, have two items, I like to go to museums and I like to learn new things, then we can expect this person high on openness to agree with these items, right? Someone who is low on openness to experience in reality will disagree with these items. So there, um, if this is true, if the model holds, then the um, um, dependencies in the data occur and we find correlations between, between traits. We can also think of this as, um, yeah, well, if they are uh, all influenced by one common source, then they overlap, which is evident in the correlations. One uh, another example to think of is if you're, uh, let's think we have um, a piece of dough um, and we make four little chunk of our, out of it and we um, bake four loaves of bread, then the loaves of bread will taste well, roughly similar. Why? 
because they all come from the same source, the same um, dough, right? In the beginning. However, um, the loaf, loaves of bread will not taste exactly the same. Why not? Well, um, for example, when you bake your first bread, the oven will be a bit cooler maybe than if you bake your second loaf of bread. So each loaf of bread or each item here also has some uniqueness to it, which I will um, come back to later. So this makes them actually different from each other. I will come back to this point later. So what does this model, uh, this common factor model look like more formally? Well, you can think of it actually as a linear regression model with the latent common factor as the um, predictor and the dependent variable are um, items. So we have six regression equations. And before I explain this model in more detail, first there are some things you need to know about the model. Well, first, the um, the, the latent common factor is standardized, so the variance is one, as you have seen here. And uh, we have, this also is the case for the observed items. So um, the variance of these items is also one. So knowing this, let's look at the model for item one. Well, this is the regression model, the predictor um, here, dependent variable here. So this shows that the um, Item uh, item one, response from item one, depend on the someone stands on the latent common factor openness to experience weight by the regression coefficient or factor loading, and also some residual or error is shown here. So, and the higher the factor loading is, the stronger the relation between the common factor and the um, item. So, in a linear regression, we have something like R squared, right? The explained variance, variance or the proportion, uh, yeah, proportion of explained variance. Um, so if we want to calculate it, we need to decompose the variance in the dependent variable. So let's take again item one um, as an example. The variance of um, item one is simply the factor loading squared times the variance of the common factor plus this residual. So first here, this is due to the common factor, right? The first part before the plus sign. Um, but we saw we say, said that openness to experience has a, a variance of one. So this part, factor learning squared times one, reduces to factor learning squared. To come up with, to arrive at the total variance, the dependent variable, item one, which is also one, right? Because the dependent variable is also standardized. To arrive at this total variance of one, we need to add the residual. And this is what I talked about earlier on the, when I, talk, I, when I talked about the baking bread example, um, the temperature is different every time. This uniqueness, these differences in conditions, this measurement error is all captured in this, um, this latter part, the variance of the residual. So here I've done, a, uh, I fitted this model just in, in, in numbers. The, um, the explained variance due to the common factor is the factor loading squared plus, and the total variance then is this factor loading squared plus this residual variance. So then if we want to calculate the proportion of explained variance due to the common factor, which is our predictor, right? We, ca we can use this formula, the factor loading squared times the variance of the um, common factor divided by the total variance of the dependent variable, the item. Um, again, because the latent variable and both the uh, dependent variable, the item, are standardized, this reduces to one and this reduces to one. So actually, in the end, R squared just reduces to the factor loading squared. So if we want to know the strength of the relation between the common factor and our items, we only need to look at the factor. This already expresses the, um, yeah, the strength of the relation between the, those two um, parameters. Another thing to know about this um, model is that if we want to calculate the expected correlation between two items, so in this case, item one and item two, we simply multiply 
the factor loading of the first item by the factor loading of the second item. And this relates to what um, Connor talked about in the first videos on different ways how we can calculate um, covariances among two traits or items, right? Because then he showed if we have two factors with their loadings on their traits and a correlation between the traits, you can calculate the correlations between the items by um, multiplying the factor loading by the correlation and then by the other factor loading. Here we do the same because you can think of this variance as a correlation of the factor with itself, right? So we actually do the same as what Connor explained in earlier videos. To find the correlation between item one and item two, we take this factor loading, multiply it by the correlation with itself, multiply it with this factor loading. Then we arrive at the um, correlation between item one and item two. This is also important uh, later on in, the, in this talk. So now I have applied the common factor model to phenotypic correlations. But of course, in principle, we can apply this model to any covariance or correlation matrix, also to our sigma A, sigma D, and sigma E. So again, I, before I did it on um, phenotypic correlation between items of openness to experience, but now let's do it for, uh, start with, for example, sigma A. What would this look like? Well, this is the, um, this is what is shown in this figure. And I will, on the next slide, I will show you some difference between the unconstrained ADE model and this model. First, let's look at what this model tells us. Well, first, here on the top, there is, um, uh, we see the common A factor that influences all the phenotypes, right? So this means that there are genes with common additive genetic effects on all, all four skin fold phenotypes. So these are the genetic effects, additive effects that all these phenotypes have in common. So this makes them more similar. There are also, as you see here below, phenotype um, specific additive genetic effects or unique genetic effects on each of the phenotypes. These are unique influences on the four phenotypes. And these are uh, only a source of variance of these four phenotypes, not of their covariance, right? It makes them more different in that sense. So as I mentioned um, before, um, this is a slide just to show you how we come from the unconstrained model to our constrained um, common factor model on the right. This is our unconstrained model on the left. As I said earlier here, we estimate 10 parameters, simply all of them, all of the unique values in this matrix that for on the diagonal variances and covariances here. These are six, so in total 10 parameters. We can also just look at the red arrows here. So, and then why do I say constraint, fitting a constraint um, factor model, common factor model on the right? Well, we see that here we only estimate one, two, three, four loadings and four unique um, additive genetic effects. So in total four plus four is eight parameters, right? So in that sense, it's really a constrained model because we fit less parameters compared to the unconstrained ADE model we saw earlier. Of course, now I only showed it for the um, additive genetic effects, but we can do the same for the um, dominance effect and the non-shared environmental effects. Again, for all of these three matrices, our constrained model, common factor model, we only estimate eight parameters for each uh, matrix. So what does this model look like um, formally? And this is important because um, this is also how we will estimate it in open mix. So this is also what we do in the practical. So it's important to remember. So keep in mind that what we want to do is um, reproduce the covariance matrix. In this, in this case, the dominance covariance matrix in terms of the unknown parameters of our model. So of common effects and unique uh, phenotype specific effects. So just as a spoiler, here below is the full formula, um, how we express it in terms of our model. 
but I will uh, walk you through it step by step. So first, let's start with the common effects in the top. Well, as I said earlier, we only need to look at for the common effects. These are um, shown by the uh, factor loadings. So what we can do is make a column vector. Um, so by the way, yeah, well, how we can neatly express this, the, the model, um, we can nicely do this with matrix algebra. So this is what I'm going to do now. So if we look at the common effects, we can, uh, we have this column vector here of factor loadings. And if we multiply it with its trans transpose, as I've shown here on the top, then we get to this, um, to, then we uh, get this matrix here. And partly this is what we want. Part, and I say partly, why? Well, as we look at the covariances, then we actually see that we, um, that, that, we, that we have what we want. Because now we express the covariance between here, for example, biceps and, biceps and triceps. We um, express it in terms of our factor loadings, right? The covariance between biceps and triceps is the correlation between biceps, the, is the factor loading of biceps multiplied by the factor loading of triceps. So this, the covariances are okay. For the variances, however, on the diagonal, we see that these are only now um, include common effects. What we saw earlier, and also here in the figure, that they are not only due to common um, dominance effects, but also due to their unique effects. So we need to um, add these somehow. So, and we do this by adding a, what we call a diagonal a matrix, why it's called diagonal, why? Well, because on the diagonal we have values, in this case our um, unique dominance uh, effects or phenotype specific dominance effects. And on the off diagonals, there are all zeros. Why are these all zero? As I said, the unique, these unique dominance effects only contribute to the variance of the, their respective traits, not on the covariance. You can also see this in this figure, right? This, um, there's only an arrow going out from the unique uh, residual variance of biceps, they are not, it's not connected with any of the other um, phenotypes. So later on in R, when you open the mix, we simply estimate um, this matrix. So then if we put all these things together of the previous slides, then we have the full formula. So we have then um, the, uh, our covariance matrix D, sigma D, expressed in terms of the parameters of a model, right? of the common effects and unique effects. The um, common effects are responsible for the covariances among the traits, and the variance, variances are due to the common effects here, but also due to the uniquenesses on the diagonal. Again, for this matrix, we only need to estimate eight parameters. So if we put this all together, so in one model, we apply this common factor model to all of our, um, the three of our covariance matrices to sigma A, sigma D, and sigma E, then we actually have our independent pathway model. So what it is, is what we do is we simply, um, yeah, implement or impose a structure to our covariance matrices where in a nutshell, we have on the top, some effects common to all phenotypes, and in the bottom, some effects um, unique to each of the phenotypes. That's basically it. So maybe it's important to mention now at this point that, um, yeah, up to, up to now, I have not talked about twins at all, right? I talked about the ADE covariance matrices and um, applying the common factor model to it. Um, but I did not talk about how we use information on twins to actually estimate this model, right? Because we need this information on twins, their similarity to be actually be able to estimate it. So this is what I'm gonna, um, this is what we're gonna do next. Well, 
applying this model is actually quite simple because it works the same um, as for the bivariate and uh, the multivariate model as we've seen before, right? Because here, this is we've seen before, uh, we see um, expected covariance matrix for MZ twins on the left and expected covariance matrix for DCs on the right. And all of these matrices are in the unconstrained IDE model P by P uh, matrices, right? So the only thing that differs now for the independent pathway model is that we, instead of really estimating these covariance matrices A, D, and E, we now simply uh, impose the model, uh, the independent pathway model with this formula that I talked you through before, so we simply estimate it by implementing this model. So that's the only um, difference um, compared to multivariate model. So everything uh, stays the same. Instead of estimating these models, we just um, express this model in terms of this formula. Right, so the only thing we need to do now um, is to connect to genetic effects to be able to estimate it, connect the genetic effects uh, um, completely exactly in the same way as we did before in the multivariate or uh, bivariate model. We need to connect the genetic effects across twins um, yeah, to be able to estimate the model. So let's do that. Now, again, this connection should probably not be um, come as a surprise to you how we do this. We've seen this before because twin DC twins, this is for DC twins because DC twins show um, um, on average share 50% of their um, DNA. The correlation across twins for the uh, additive genetic effects is 0.50. And for dominance effects, this is 0.25. We do this for the common factors, but also for the unique Effects, right, so this is just the same as in the multivariate and in the bivariate case, we connect the twins according to um, our model, 0 0.50, 0 0.25 for disease in this case. Um, so again, not that different from the unconstrained ADE model, the only difference being the model that we impose, our independent pathway model, that we impose on the covariance matrices. So now that I have outlined the independent pathway model, um, in the next video, I will talk about fitting different models, comparing them, and also interpreting um, the results of these models.